This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Monday, November 30th, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. Trust in media is at near historic lows, and some people don't even trust traditional media outlets these days to get them a basically fair take on, well, anything. But perhaps that's not altogether new. In his new book, The Radio Right, How a Band of Broadcasters Took on the Federal Government and Built the Modern Conservative Movement, Paul Matsko details radio's former fairness doctrine and how fears of that doctrine, both real and imagined, helped give birth to a new conservative movement. Yeah, I had to resist the impulse uh, when writing the book to put fairness doctrine in quotation marks every time I I put it in because it's, you know, the critics of it at the time like to call it the unfairness doctrine. uh, So they accomplished the opposite purpose. But what it was uh, in the 1950s, uh, progressive uh, broadcast reformers, well-intentioned, naive, but well-intentioned reformers said, we need to have two things. We need to have radio stations, which at the time in the early 50s were dominated by the big networks, your your CBSs, your NBCs, that kind of thing. They're dominated by the big networks, and the big networks didn't like to to have too much uh, controversial speech on on politics and current events. It was all very anodyne, middle-of-the-road consensus politics. And... um, So the reformers said, look, we want them to speak into politics, into elections, into controversial issues of public importance, to use Core political speech. Core political speech. We want more of that. It's getting too boring and anodyne. But when they do it, we don't want them to express their political points of view in an unbalanced way. So the Fairness Doctrine was meant to encourage uh, radio station license holders and television station license holders to air this controversial political speech, but then not to choose one side, not to favor one side over the other too much. They weren't supposed to editorialize too much. Um, and so the idea was if you had someone on, one of your uh, pr- one of your hosts said something that was against the Vietnam War, you should have at some point in time during the week someone come on and be for the Vietnam War, at least in theory. In the abstract, this was not supposed to favor any one side. It was supposed to be broadly applicable to everyone. Uh, It gets passed in 1959. It it is honored in the breach exclusively until the Kennedy administration. So Kennedy's elected in 1960. He has a, a really close election that year. He wins by a hair in the popular vote. He actually fraudulently stole the election of democratic machine politics in Illinois and Louisiana delivered him the electoral votes he needed to beat Nixon. But the point of this is he is paranoid. He's worried about the the top priority of a first term president is to become a second term president. So he's thinking about reelection right away. And one of the things that has been bothering him in the election of 1960 is the rise of this new wave of of right wing radio? What I call the radio right. Now, a so, lot of these guys yeah. were preachers. Yes, yeah. So the most prominent was a fellow named Carl McIntyre. Uh, he was a fundamentalist Presbyterian preacher from New Jersey. Uh, he went from having two radio stations that aired his program, his uh, daily radio program, in 1956 to more than 400 by 1962, um, peaking at close to 500 in 1964. So he goes from nobody to a nationwide influence with an estimated weekly listening audience of 20 million people, which is as many as Rush Limbaugh at his peak 40 years later. So that's as much as NPR has uh, as few as recently as a few years ago. Exactly. So just as you wouldn't write uh, a history of politics in the 21st century, in the 2000s or 90s, without accounting for both, you know, the influence of public radio and talk radio, uh, we should think the same way about the 60s. And yet, these guys get almost ignored. But Kennedy's worried about them because they're always attacking the Kennedy administration, accusing them of being soft on communism and and so on. Was part of that uh, that these guys were Protestants and? Uh, John Kennedy was a well-known Catholic. Was that part of the 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 yeah. vitriol uh, thrown at him? Definitely, it didn't help. I mean, it was both his Catholic faith in the election of 1960. Uh, you know, he was going to sell the country out to the the Pope, you know, or something like that. Um, and and that does feel a little bit alien today when anti-Catholicism feels 
odds in our current political configuration because it's been, become so united with Judeo. The whole Judeo-Christian thing was invented in the mid 20th century, but we we take it as a matter of course now. But prior to that, the divide between Protestants and Catholics was one of the crucial canyons in American culture and politics for, for most of our, our national history. Um, so they don't like that. They also don't like his policies. He's a, a Democrat, liberal by their standards, not necessarily by our standards today. And they're always attacking him on the airwaves over and over again. So Kennedy's casting about what tool is at hand that I can use to take on, take these guys down a notch. And the tool that is at hand is the fairness doctrine. How did that work practically? Uh, you know, the, the fairness doctrine itself is just this extremely fuzzy notion about uh, representing a very crude kind of diversity on the airwaves, on individual uh, stations. But how did he practically use it as a, a, a cudgel against these preachers and, and, and right wingers more broadly? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so he, um, first of all, it wasn't actually his idea. He wanted to take them down a notch, but he outsourced the planning. Uh, some uh, allies of his in, in the labor movement, the Ruther brothers, Walter and Victor Ruther, head of the United Auto Workers, they were commissioned to come up with a plan for the reelection campaign. And what they came up with was a kind of a multi prong campaign, the most two important prongs of which were to use the Internal Revenue Service to audit. Uh, to audit them to death, to try to challenge their tax-exempt status and dry up the flow of funds to right-wing radio broadcasters. Because uh, their funding model was actually close to what an NPR uh, fundraising pledge drive is like. It was mostly small-dollar donations that, that fueled um, tax-exempt donations that fueled right-wing radio in the 60s. The other prong was the Fairness Doctrine prong. And that was to go to the Federal Communications Commission which has, uh, that's who issues the licenses to broadcast stations. And to say, uh, part of, when we review your license, because uh, they have to be renewed every couple of years, when we re review your, your behavior for license renewal, we want to see that you have been making a good faith effort at fulfilling the, you know, the fairness doctrine requirement. And if there are complaints on your record, uh, if people submit complaints saying that you did not extend fairness doctrine privileges to them, then we'll have to consider whether or not you get your license. Now, a license for a radio station, that's an existen that's a matter of existential weight. Without yeah, a license, it's, it's, it's everything. It's everything. I mean, so this is the death sentence for a radio station owner, most of whom are not wealthy people. This also coincides with the rise of independent radio, the number of stations that are owned that are not network affiliates that are independently owned uh, and operated goes from 95 from 5% in the early 50s to uh, more than half uh, by the end, end of the 1950s so these are mostly like think of like a car salesman like a local businessman or a restaurant owner they have they buy a radio station uh it's a small you know uh i mean they're barely meeting operating costs each month uh, they have a license now, an AM radio license, because it's cheap. Uh, but even the a little bit of pressure on them, the threat of having a fairness doctrine complaint filed, the need to hire a lawyer to defend themselves at license renewal time, all of that carries great weight with these little, small-scale independent operators. And so even the threat of a fairness doctrine complaint can often convince them to drop right-wing programming altogether and have a chilling effect on speech. So Kennedy knows that. That's That's the second prong of this plan. Interestingly, you are in Maine, if I may say. Yep. I am speaking to you from Kentucky. And uh, the what strikes me is that in rural areas in particular, there may be some incredible homogeneity of views about how the world works, about politics, uh, and having a radio station uh, being compelled to present opposing views. Um, even if, if it's, uh, at, you know, the, the, the political divide is, was a lot smaller, uh, than it is, uh, today in, in the sixties or the early sixties anyway, it, it seems that the, the, uh, what these small stations would have been asked to do is either put on a bunch of programming that nobody wants to listen to or risk losing your license. And so right. it's either substantially harm potential profits or 
you go out of business. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. And I won't get into the weeds here. You know, I have to read my my book, uh, you know, the radio right uh, for that. But it, um, they actually, as part of this push, Kennedy talks to the head of the FCC and tells him explicitly, uh, I want you to keep stations fair. He explicitly appeals to the fairness doctrine. The FCC chairman, a guy named E. William Henry, he passes what's known as the Coleman Doctrine, which is kind of a proviso on the fairness doctrine, which requires any response time. So if I say the Vietnam War is terrible, bad, horrible, no good, or the you know the Johnson administration, the Gulf of Tonkin was just the pretext for war, and someone says, well, you criticize the Johnson administration, the administration, the DNC would like response time saying, no, the Vietnam War is great. This actually happened. This is not just hypothetical. You would have to give them that time. And if they said they couldn't pay for it, and no one ever said they could pay for it, you have to give it to them for free. So anytime someone says something controversial, the other side could say, I want free response time. So it has a huge chilling effect, even when it operates the way it's supposed to, which is equitably that it would go after both right-wing and left-wing stations. Even in that case, it would have a massive chilling effect because it just doesn't pay to air controversial or radical political speech. But this is crucial. It was not applied equitably. It was only ever targeted at right-wing radio speech. The Kennedy administration was not going after, and they actually created front organizations to launder ally money to gin up faux grassroots fairness doctrine campaigns against stations that aired right-wing radio hosts who were critical of the Kennedy administration. Um, So it was always, you know, so the best case scenario, it would have a massive chilling effect on speech, but this was not the best case scenario. It was just targeted censorship of right-wing radio stations. And and right-wingers appropriately were very concerned about that for uh, many years, because even though the fairness doctrine remained on the books for a long time, it really was, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it was really never enforced to the extent that it was by the Kennedy administration and his allies. Yeah. So it's the peak of the fairness doctrine. There was an enforcement push that I describe in the book from like 63 through 67. And it's very effective about half uh, of stations that have been airing right-wing, you know, radio programs, dropped them entirely. So you you, you censored, ha- you got half of them to drop them just like that. It then gets honored, uh, not in act. The Nixon administration takes up that tool. It's just a convenient regulatory tool lying around waiting for, um, you know, uh, political operatives with, with a lack of ethics. And uh, the Nixon administration, they target it not at radio, but at television. So they go to like the heads of CBS, have a meeting and say, so we don't like your coverage of the Nixon administration's conduct of the war in Vietnam. You're talking about these like Pentagon paper types. Uh, it's just uh, really makes us look bad. It would be a shame if we had to gin up some sort of fairness doctrine campaign or something. So it was the threat of the fairness doctrine was sufficient to, to extract um, concessions from the big television networks uh, in during the Nixon administration. They ever actually had to use it, though. Um, Ken, uh, Nixon did other uh, uh, sketchy things involving the FCC going after political opponents. Um, but so it was used indirectly by the uh, as well by by Nixon. By the 70s, uh, Carter, who is the actual great deregulator. He, Absolutely. And I challenge anyone to uh Come up against that claim, please. If you can come up with a bigger deregulator in the latter half of the 20th century, I'm all ears. There's one. It's it's popular in right wing circles to say bad things about Carter, but like the reason why you have your fancy craft brews, the beer industry is because of Carter. The reason our air uh, airplane ticket prices are so much lower is because of Carter, and the reason he he instructs his, his FCC. Uh, says we're not going to enforce the fairness doctrine anymore. It it remains on the books until the Reagan administration, but they stop enforcement in the late 70s. So there's this window of about 15 years where the fairness doctrine is a real live concern. All right. Notably, Nixon made use of a regulatory tool that was adopted just before the Kennedy administration came into office and made use of it to harm his political opponents. Yeah. And then for a long time, nothing happened. So fast forward now, mm-hmm. there are members of the, notably of the U.S. Senate, 
who believe that social media companies pose a grave threat because they do not play fair. The argument goes that Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, other uh, Twitter, uh, other social media sites are overwhelmingly owned by leftists, people who consider themselves progressives. And by virtue of that fact, conservative speech is squelched. So people like Josh Hawley of Missouri, Tom Cotton, uh, and some other members of, of the U.S. Senate, Ted Cruz has been a supporter of this idea, want to regulate social media by giving the federal government essentially uh, veto power over their ability to operate their businesses in good standing with the federal government. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And in fact, some of the calls for um, government oversight of online content moderation um, very explicitly uh, appeal to this body of jurisprudence and administrative law around broadcasting. So that the, the calls for a non-discrimination mandate for online social media platforms uh, is an, is really a is just an application of the kind of the fairness doctrine principle and related public interest law to a new medium uh, media form. Uh, it's a remarkably bad idea uh, for a variety of reasons. But let's I'll start by let's just stipulate. Let's say conservatives are correct that these social media platforms are on the margins discriminating against political speech. I, I don't think that's true. Uh, there's a great uh, paper written by uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Matthew Feeney showing just how little evidence there is of algorithmic discrimination by the media platforms. But let's say it, it is true. Uh, before you swing an ax uh, at some of the key protections for the, the shape of, of the modern internet, like Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, before you swing that ax, consider that the head of that ax could fly off, hit you in the shin, and cause far worse damage than the thing you're trying to take down. Um, it's the shoe on the other foot test. And the reason why they should be aware of this is that we have seen in our in living memory uh, an attempt to ensure fairness in broadcasting went horribly awry. And the people who were the, the, the largest recipients of that oppression, of that censorship, were right-wing media broadcasters. And there is every reason to expect, if it is true, that uh, uh, say the, I don't know the left, progressives, liberals, I don't know whatever uh, boogeyman you want to pick, control uh, major institutions in American society from government to media to education and so on. If you create a regulatory tool that can be so easily abused for partisan gain, who do you think is ultimately, even if you get to use it right now to protect your speech and to punish other kinds of speech, who do you think is going to be the ultimate target of that? convenient regulatory tool that you created and just left lying around for the next unscrupulous administration to use. That's There's a cautionary tale there. Yeah. Barack Obama expressed concern that he was leaving a loaded gun in the White House uh, <laughs> yeah. shortly uh, after his election. But the... Um, yeah, the other the other thing that's notable uh, about about this is that you can understand the the paranoia, and just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Um, and it seems odd that the response here is to create regulatory tools that would enable the feds to engage in exactly the kinds of uh, discrimination and create chilling effects for uh, all manner. And maybe maybe the the right wingers who are supporting this stuff are people who believe that there will never be a time when conservative speech is punished because uh, the 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 folks in Silicon Valley, the these tech giants, are never going to be right wingers like themselves. Yeah, I mean, imagine. Let's put this in practical terms. Imagine a scenario in which we empower a government AG, uh, agency, and, and Josh Hawley selected the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, for his plan. Other people have selected different agents. Um, it was empowered to basically reward or punish uh, internet platforms 
uh, content, internet content producers, depending on whether they were considered to have been discriminatory in what content they moderated. Well, first of all, that's all in the eye of the beholder. Like what counts as, as, as first of all, what counts as political content is in the eye of the beholder versus hate speech, right? Like, so the line between what's hate speech and what's acceptable speech, what's obscenity, what's not obscenity, all that is super fuzzy. And then when you empower a government agency to make those decisions, it, it, brings it into the political process. So depending on what balance, I mean, imagine how currently decisions are made by partisan pan government panels. Uh, it's It all hinges on, well, what's the ratio of Democrats to Republicans? So you can imagine a situation in which, uh, you know, the decision about whether or not Facebook should moderate, should, should remove more right-wing content or more left-wing content is just going to hinge on the party in power and the balance of power at that agency. And that's just a disastrous situation. I mean, uh, apply this in the, in, in the most extreme sense. Um, these days, internet content producers are not just social media companies. It includes every standard publication. I mean, National Review has, an, has a website. It is a content producer. So you can imagine it, someone coming along and saying, well, Look, you had pieces submitted to you by uh, by liberal authors that you turned down. All you're putting out is is I mean, you can see the ludicrousness of the idea of applying a fairness doctrine type system to the modern internet. It would just it would just break our the system. Facebook and Twitter can hire lawyers. Yeah, uh, they have lawyers in house who are keenly aware of uh, the potential for regulation to harm them. Then there's a, you know, the costs of regulatory compliance fall least heavily on incumbent companies. Uh, if you create a system of, of new regulations uh, that drive up those costs, you actually are creating a, uh, an anti-competitive moat uh, around the current incumbent organizations, making it harder for upstarts to enter in to compete uh, and making it harder for people who find the decisions of the incumbent players to be discriminatory makes it harder for them to find and create alternatives because again, those costs fall most heavily on upstart or upstart companies. So it, the irony is that you end up producing the very thing that you're afraid of. You lock people in to these incumbent players that you're worried about. You don't actually free them from those incumbent players. And we can see this. I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but you can see this with what happened in the European Union with their GDPR, their uh, privacy regulation. The, the intended, one of the intended purposes was to take down the influence, the relative influence of big American companies like Google, which was dominating the uh, advertising, online advertising market, was to take them down a notch, encourage competition. But it's had exactly the opposite of the intended effect. It has actually locked in Google's dominance. Their their ad share has actually risen as a result of GDPR because of they're better able to you know to field those uh, costs of regulatory compliance. Paul Matsko is author of The Radio Right: How a Band of Broadcasters Took on the Federal Government and Built the Modern Conservative Movement. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast anywhere you please, and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 